Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of the new definition of fermented food. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers. Dr. Bob Hutkins, Professor of Food Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and David Arith of Sonoma Brinery. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. I will come back at the end to answer some questions for now, I will turn it over to you, David and Bob. Well, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today, and especially in the uh, uh, presence of so august a member of our community uh, who has, uh, uh, as Amelia mentioned, written one of the cornerstone uh, uh, texts in, in, I don't know anybody in my business that doesn't own this book, um, uh, the second edition, well, recently published second edition of Microbiology and technology of fermented foods. Uh, professor Bob Hutkins is the Kem Shahani Professor of Food and Microbiology in the Food Science and Technology Department at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, the Hutkins lab that he runs studies bacteria important uh, in human health and in fermented foods. He has published widely on probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, and fermented foods. And is the, uh, as we mentioned, the author of uh, the, this cornerstone book. And if, if you folks don't have this book, run over to Amazon or somewhere and buy it soon. Microbiology and the Technology of Fermented Foods. Uh, Professor uh, Hutkin serves uh, on the board of directors uh, for the ISAP, which is the International Society uh, uh, International Scientific Association for uh, Pro and Prebiotics. And these folks are doing some very interesting definitional work. And I urge everybody who is in the industry to pay close attention to what these folks are doing, because while we all think we may know what a probiotic is or have our own idea, and we all think we know what fermented foods are, uh, Professor Hudkins is here today to uh, offer us some insight on a definition that I think is fascinating. And uh, certainly we're gonna be uh, engaging a lot more, I think as in, in, in the industry with the ISAP group. For those of you who missed uh, uh, Mary Ellen uh, Sanders uh, presentation with Maria Marco, uh, that was a fascinating uh, discussion of what a probiotic actually is. And since many of us put this on our labels, we should be paying close attention to what these folks are uh, uh, doing because they are the scientific backbone of our industry. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Robert. Uh, Robert, by the way, uh, is kind of a foodie. He has a, a column in the uh, uh, Lincoln Journal Star called Ask the Food Doc. So I'm going to ask the food doc, what's a fermented food? There we go. All right, so thank you for the terrific introduction. I think uh, hopefully the screen's showing up and we can get started. So um, it's a real honor to be, uh, to be presenting this topic um, today on fermented foods. Um, again, my, my favorite topic of all. All right. So uh, just a brief outline of what I'll be discussing today. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a big fan of, of history, so I'll provide a little bit of a historical context on fermented foods, and then I'll get into this new definition um, and the thinking behind it, and I'll spend some time on fermented foods and gut health. And I, I want to point out that the, the, um, the consensus paper definition um, came out in January 2021 um, in this very prestigious journal, Nature Reviews Gastroenterology and Hepatology. So um, it has all the details. It's a, um, a great read. It was authored by 12 outstanding uh, experts plus myself, um, led by Maria Marco, um, but you'll recognize some other people on here that I think have spoken to the Fermentation Association. So Mary Ellen Sanders and, uh, and 
Ben Wolf has spoken, Michael Gonzalez has spoken. So it's a real all-star cast of people in the field, a clinician, Dan Merenstein. So we, were, we had a, a lot of diversity represented here in the field of fermentation microbiology. So this is the fourth consensus paper that ISAP has published. Um, and uh, the other ones were on probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics. And these are intended to serve stakeholders, providing stakeholders, and those stakeholders are consumers, manuf manufacturers, government agencies, as well as scientists and clinicians with accurate nutrition information, clear, concise definitions, and, and with the expectation that it brings some clarity to, to many of these issues that frankly people are um, confused about. So why have fermented foods been so popular for oh, roughly 10,000 years? So for many of, many of you listening today, you probably are familiar with some of these reasons, but we'll go through them. So number one, probably the most important uh, 10,000 years ago in the absence of refrigeration and proper packaging and so forth, was that fermented foods lasted a long time. In fact, they were probably the original shelf-stable foods. Fermented foods have enhanced functionality. A simple uh, flour water mixture makes a nice flatbread, but let the airborne yeast get into that dough and you get these wonderful breads. Of course, we now know, and this is important, um, back year, thousands of years ago, it's important now, they have enhanced economic value. Um, inexpensive commodities into highly valued, um, the original value added foods. And of course they have terrific sensory properties that we appreciate visually, aroma and so forth. Now why have fermented foods become so popular more recently? So in addition to those reasons I just mentioned, it's become appreciated that they have enhanced nutritional value. And I'll talk about this um, a little bit later, not only the foods, the, the macronutrients, but the live microbes. Okay, so why have fermented foods been especially popular in the last 15 years? And um, this is a shameless plug, but I do have an expensive wine habit. So, um, so I mentioned the fermented foods book. But um, the nutrition issue I think has really been driving um, interest in fermented foods. And this is from a 2018 survey of nutritionists uh, published in Today's Dietitian. And the most popular superfood, if you want to call it that, was fermented food. 2019, number one, fermented food. 2020, most popular food, fermented food. And guess what? In 2021, it still remains at the top of the list. So fermented foods have definitely have a lot of buzz behind them. In fact, it checks all the boxes, artisanal, local, organic, natural, healthy, flavorful, sustainable, innovative. It's got the hip funky factor, Instagram worthy. Um, just as a side, um, I have an older brother who lives, he and his wife live in a one room cottage up in upstate New York. And uh, <clears throat> he's not very um, engaged in social media at all, but he does. Um, they, 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 they um, during the 2020, they learned how to make sourdough bread. And he sent me three pictures. It doesn't have Instagram account, but he sent me three pictures of his wonderful sourdough breads that he was so proud of. Um, so my point is that, that it's caught the, the, the public, um, uh, kind of the, the, the public eye with um, all these things. All right, and this has led to a bunch of popular press books. Of course, Sandra Katz's book um, really uh, captured the public attention. But all these books, this thing here fermented, this was a, a movie I saw on, on Netflix not that long ago, pretty entertaining, but all these popular press books on fermentation. But scientists have also become engaged in this field um, in the last 20 years and um, you know, in the top journal. So, Science Magazine published in 2007, this CRISPR paper, you've all heard of CRISPR, won the Nobel Prize, but you may not have known that the function of CRISPR was discovered in Streptococcus thermophilus, the yogurt organism. This wonderful paper by Ben Wolf and his group, 
on understanding the ecology of cheese rind published in Cell, one of the most prestigious biology journals there is. And this great paper by um, uh, Ercolini's group on associating lactic acid bacteria in foods with lactic acid bacteria in the gut. And then the um, fermented foods consensus paper, much to our um, pleasure, our surprise, made the cover of the Nature Reviews Gastroenterology earlier this month. Uh, very cool. And Dave, you'll be glad to see all those pickled vegetables in there. I am. So when we first started this project, I have to admit, um, when we were asked to develop this panel on, ferment, for, on defining fermentation, I thought, what's the point? Doesn't everybody know what fermentation is? It's one of those things that I know when I see it, but, um, but we were compelled to come up with a, a definition. And the biochemical definition, and I'm not gonna go through this, but it has to do with electrons and energy and, and, and so forth, um, was not very suitable because it, it doesn't, it applies to some fermented foods, but doesn't apply to things like natto and tempe and mold ripened foods and, and um, prosciutto hands, it didn't apply. So we needed a definition that conveyed this simple message of a raw food turned into a fermented food via microorganisms. Um, and what we ultimately arrived at and you probably have seen this if you've seen the paper, is this very concise, less than 15 word definition. Fermented foods are made through desired microbial growth and enzymatic conversions of food components. Now I have to say that these consensus statements um, have this panel of experts and consensus means we have to agree. And we all have opinions and we actually went back and forth on this word desired. So we thought deliberate, intentional, but we wanted to convey a positive attribute to this, to the intentional or to the deliberate growth of microorganisms. So um, we're, we, we're very satisfied with this definition. Again, we had all had to agree, and I have to admit, we probably had to consume some fermented uh, beverages to get to consensus. But this desire meant that, that it, that these positive attributes may not be positive for everybody. So some of you may not like sour beer or natto or runny camembert or moldy um, salami, but nonetheless, that's what we agreed on. Now, there were other issues raised in the um, Marco paper um, that I would like to uh, go, go through. We'll take a few minutes on these. And, and the first question was how our fermentation started. And again, most of you in the audience probably uh, know the answer to that, but many people are, are confused by that. Um, how does one know if food is fermented or not? And even many uh, food scientists don't know that. And this other question, which fermented foods actually contain live microbes is also a source of considerable confusion. Okay, so we know uh, many of us that are engaged in, in the um, fermented foods industry that we can start fermentations one of three ways. Um, a natural or a spontaneous fermentation, which is really about the only reliable way to make many fermented um, foods like fermented vegetables. Um, there's the back sloppy method, which is still used. Sourdough bread, for example, is a form of back slopping. Traditional kefir is a form of back slopping. But most modern fermentations, industrial fermentations, use starter cultures. Um, and in fact, most of the starter cultures used in large scale fermentations are strain defined and even genome defined. So a lot of these cultures have their complete genome sequence um, with many of the functions and traits identified. And indeed, the functions and traits that are most important for starter cultures are based on performance, flavor, texture, speed, not health benefits, not health benefits. So modern production, is large volume and highly automated. So these are just some pictures of um, a cheese factory. I think I could see one or two workers in this entire cheese factory, um, a, a brewing brewing bottle. And I don't see anybody working there. They're up they're, they're operating these large scale with a few touches of a keypad, you know, a bakery with a couple of workers and you can see the keypad. In contrast, there, 
small scale traditional processing still occurs, very labor intensive. Um, yet this is still not only common in many industries, but in some parts of the world, for example, in Europe where they have protect, protected designation of origin um, rules, you're required to make, um, this happens to be Grana Padana factory that I visit, you're required to make cheese manually in these small vats. You're not even allowed to use a starter culture. You're required to use, a, use the way, a back slopping method for some of these products. And I should point out that when I, when I mentioned before the, that, that, that fermented foods now have this craft-like, or, or many of the, the, the um, small-scale fermentation facilities are, are, are done in a craft-style manner, um, this is now the, the norm for a lot of small-scale operations that rely on craft-scale fermentations. Okay, so um, which foods are fermented and not fermented? Again, this audience knows all these familiar foods that are fermented, yet there are many foods that appear to be fermented that are not. So you could actually acidify milk products and make cottage cheese and cream cheese without fermentation. You could just add the acid to the milk, do the same thing with the sausage. Um, many of the audiences that I speak to are very surprised to hear that the, um, that the olives on their pizza or in their martini um, are not fermented. Same goes for pickles. These are, a lot of these products are simply put into brines, um, at least in the United States and other parts of the world that would be different. Um, and breads can be chemically leavened. You could actually make soy sauce uh, via chemical means. And I wanna point out that the, that we just, we, um, the consensus panel um, made this point that salad dressings made with yogurt or mustard made with vinegar do not make those foods a fermented foods. They contain fermented ingredients. And then there's this uh, very troublesome question about which foods contain live microbes. Um, and so many of the dairy, kefir yogurt, um, uh, cheeses, plant milk-based cultured products, um, some of the Asian products, kombucha, some of the porridges that are consumed in, in Africa and Asia contain live microbes when consumed. But then there's some sometimes. So some kimchi and sauerkrauts, if they're not heat treated, they'll contain live microbes. Um, tempeh will contain live microbes, but most usually tempeh is then cooked, so maybe not. Um, and then there's some no's. So things like that are baked, pasteurized, filtered or cooked, microbes will be absent. A good rule of thumb is if the product is stored at room temperature, it's a good bet it does not contain live microbes. I would say one, maybe one of the exceptions would be some of the, like an Italian's dry Italian salami um, that you'll see in delis um, that probably uh, ha may have some live microbes. So there are more issues addressed in Marco et al. I'd like to briefly um, point out about food safety, health benefits, and probiotics. And these were um, previously addressed in some really outstanding um, webinars by Fred Bright, um, 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 Mary Ellen, and uh, gosh, I'm dying today. Um, I'm having a brain freeze. Um, Chris um, um, on fermented dairy and health. So I'll briefly go through this. Um, so does fermentation improve food safety? Unequivocally, yes. So products of fermentation, acids, um, alcohol, the low pH from those organic acids, all account, contribute to food safety. Plus many of these foods have salt added, nitrite, bactericins produced by the culture, and just the competition all enhance food safety. Plus microbes in, in fermented foods generally can improve digestibility and may degrade anti-nutrients that are found in certain raw materials. And do fermented foods have food safety risks in contrast? Rarely, with few exceptions, fermented, fermentation microbes are safe, non-pathogenic and do not produce harmful products. Even the fungi um, that are used in, in mold fermented foods have been demonstrated to be uh, non-mycotoxin producing. 
So we can conclude that when properly made from safe and wholesome ingredients, fermented foods are rarely associated with foodborne disease, um, notwithstanding that they may contain high salt levels, um, alcohol, and this thing called biogenic amines that we do find in some foods and has raised some concern um, in some countries. Now, I mentioned before that fermented foods can be heat treated. And so why would somebody want to do want to heat treat foods, um, heat treat fermented foods? And of course, um, it's to enhance food safety. In fact, in, in the US, many of the fermented meats um, are heat treated because we, they have to comply with HACCP regulations. So to enhance food safety and or increase shelf life, especially those foods that want to be stored at ambient temperature. So heat treatment is common for fermented vegetables, sausages, as I mentioned, uh, beer, vinegar. Um, you may be surprised to hear that, that the number one consumer of yogurt in the next five years will probably be China. And most, most of that yogurt is called ambient yogurt. It's heat treated, um, it's, it's um, stable at room temperature, stable during transportation. Um, and that kind of an, that ambient yogurt is also expanding into um, Latin America, Africa, and other parts of the Pacific Rim. Um, and, but it's heat treated. The other reason for heat treating for fermented foods is to stop the fermentation, um, reduce subsequent souring and gassing, which can be a problem in foods that um, where the fermentation results in CO2. So heat inactivates the health promoting microbes, but other health attributes likely remain. Okay, so now I wanna move on to um, uh, health, the health benefits and the possible mechanisms. So we um, described in the um, consensus paper, all the things that can, or many of the things that can go on in the, in the food during fermentation to improve the, um, uh, to improve the nutritional properties of those foods. So lactose fermented, fermentation um, or fermentation of dairy products reduces lactose and some, um, some foods that contain gluten or casein, they can be degraded and reduce allergenicity perhaps. Um, there can be vitamins produced in those in certain foods. Exopolysaccharides may have prebiotic properties. Um, I mentioned anti-nutrients can be active, inactivated like phytic acid and alcohol and and, and, and grapes can enhance polyphenol extraction. Um, but uh, there's probably the most interest in this, in, in this property that the, that the uh, microbes in those fermented foods can reach the gut and pro provide benefits in vivo. And so the first question is the, the, that I wanted to, to address is what is there even evidence that fermentation microbes can actually reach the gut alive and well. So I guess about 20 years ago, there was a, a lot of suggestion when we were doing, uh, when we were analyzing um, um, fecal samples using um, cultural methods that perhaps these microbes aren't, um, aren't surviving and reaching the gut. Um, but we now have more, more powerful methods of, of detection. Some of these methods are based on on, on um, molecular tools, but now there's convincing evidence that lactic acid bacteria and others can survive digestion and reach the gut. There's a great paper from uh, Ercolini I referred to before. They looked at lactic acid bacteria in the gut and among the most prevalent were two dairy related starter culture microbes, Streptomophilus and Lactococcus lactis okay, in the human gut. There's a great paper. Um, um, I, I really like this paper from um, Korean researchers. And they looked at um, 69 subjects and they examined the fecal contents of those subjects. And every single one of them harbored lactic acid bacteria that derive from kimchi. So they eat kimchi three times a day in Korea. So it made sense. Oh, these, I should point out, these were octogenarians. Um, so um, it maybe was not a surprise, but every one of them harbored at least one lactic acid bacteria, kimchi lactic acid bacteria in their GI tract. I'm gonna come back to this paper in a little bit. 
So then the next question that begs the question, is it possible to consume enough of those microbes to make a difference? These other papers just detected them. Can we consume enough to make a difference? And the answer to that is it depends. So um, this is a study from my lab where we surveyed retail products for, the, uh, for how many lactic acid bacteria were in um, cultured dairy products, fermented vegetables, and some of the Asian fermented products. And for the most part, there's a wide range here, but the, for the most part, they contain about 10 to the seventh, that's about 10 million um, lactic acid bacteria per gram with a pretty wide range. So can you consume enough to make a difference? Well, it depends on where you live and who you are. So if, you're, if you live in the Netherlands where they consume a cup of yogurt almost every day, based on those numbers that I just reported, and you consumed 100 grams, you could get 10 to the 11th, it's 100 billion. Okay, you can get that many microbes every day. Or if you live in Korea and ate kimchi three times a day, you could get 10 to the 10th. So if you eat a diet rich in fermented foods, you could perhaps, um, a, that could perhaps account for 1% of the commensal microbes in your GI tract, which in my view would be significant. So what is the evidence that fermented foods provide health benefits? And there is a lot of observational and epidemiological evidence to support this. And so uh, we know that some diets are associated with health and longevity. Um, uh, many of these diets are rich in fermented foods. They contain live microbes. So it's reasonable to hypothesize that for the fermented foods and those microbes are partially responsible for these health benefits. So there's all sorts of data. I'm just going to show a few slides here. Um, um, this happens to be a, a study, a, a cohort study with 2,000 elderly adults without metabolic syndrome, and they tracked them for three years. And the conclusion was from what they had eaten that yogurt, whether it was high fat, low fat or non-fat, um, was associated with reduced risk of metabolic syndrome. And then there's, a, uh, again, I could go through a, a 20 of these, but I'm just gonna point out a, a few more. Here's a study that showed that um, natto and miso, but not total soy, just natto and miso was associated with lower risk of mortality. Again, an epidemiological study. There's another one that shows high consumption of kimchi, fermented seafood, miso, rice, wine, and beer, all fermented foods associated with the lower prevalence of atopic dermatitis. Here's a, re a very recent study that just came out this month that shows that consumption of cabbage and fermented vegetables associated with re mitigation, perhaps, of COVID severity. Okay, very interesting study. But more powerful than epidemiological or observational studies are human clinical studies. Mary Ellen Sanders pointed out in a previous webinar, this is the highest level of, of, of evidence that one can, um, can, can rely on. Unfortunately, except for yogurt, there are few well-designed randomly controlled trials with fermented foods. So this is the number of RCTs in the PubMed database as of yesterday, okay? And you could see, the, um, you know, for some products, kimchi six, kombucha one, and this one is one that Dan Marenstein is leading, okay? There are just very few um, RCTs. Um, and many of these are small with 20 or 30 subjects over four weeks. So it's really, it's asking too much um, to, to study, um, health benefits that have a long, that where, the, where the measurement takes a long time, like um, heart disease or cancer. You can't do an RCT over years um, um, with a lot of subjects. So this is the challenge. And then I know Mary Ellen Sanders did address this topic, but our, our consensus panel also um, raised this question, what's the difference between fermented foods and probiotics? Probably the most asked question that we get um, and a source of considerable confusion. Um, and so as Mary Ellen pointed out, the term probiotic should only be used when there's a demonstrated health benefit on the host that is conferred by well-defined and characterized live microbes. And 
And therein lies the problem. Fermented foods contain uncharacterized, undefined microbes. So kimchi, sauerkraut will vary from batch to batch. The microbes are not characterized and they're not defined. And as I just pointed out, health benefits associated with those microbes has not been established. So you cannot say, and, and our consensus panel was pretty emphatic, cannot say that fermented foods are the same as probiotics. Here's that kimchi study I pointed out before. And those authors of that paper did identify an, an elk fermentum from that kimchi. And they showed that it inhibited pathogens had anti-inflammatory activities in vitro. For this kimchi to be a probiotic kimchi, they would have to then take that strain, do a random, randomized control trial, show that it had a health benefit in humans, and somehow demonstrate that that microbe was in, was in every batch of kimchi. So it's asking way too much to do that kind of thing. So that's, that's the problem with using that term um, um, too loosely to call a fermented food a probiotic food. Now, that being said, there are fermented foods that contain, that are made by fermentation organisms that are probiotic, that are well-defined. So the Good Belly product that has Alplantarum 299V, the Yakult's product that has uh, LKCI strain Chirota, have been evaluated in clinical trials to show health benefit and are the fermentation microbes. But these are, there's not too many of the, these examples. Okay, so um, I am getting close to the end, so I'm, I'm on time. So uh, one final question. Should fermented foods, especially those that contain live microbes, be included as part of the dietary guidelines? So ISAP has been um, engaged in this question. We're working, uh, we have an ISAP group and, and we partnered with ILSI, another group, to address this question. And this is from a paper, a, kind of an essay from Colin Hill, an RDA for microbes, are you getting your daily dose? You know, should we be recommending increased consumption of fermented foods? So um, this is one of my all time favorite slides, I have to admit. Um, so why is the gut microbiota in need of repair? And this summarizes kind of the state of the field. So we're born the wrong way. We don't have much choice here. We're born the wrong way. So we should not be born in the ER room by cesarean. Sorry about that. Um, we probably should not be drinking by drinking out of a bottle. Um, some of us still do. Um, we should probably should not be taking so many antibiotics when we're young. We have a sedentary lifestyle full of stress. We're germophobic and we eat this Western diet. This Western diet is high fat, high calorie, high carb, um, high, um, uh, high sugar, devoid of fiber, and most importantly, is sterile. We, um, I know college students that that eat it, have have Starbucks and a Starbucks for breakfast, this for for lunch, and maybe a frozen entree they put in the oven for dinner. They got no microbes during the course of the day, literally none. And all of these things are thought to contribute to this, what we call a, a dysbiotic state, altered intestinal microbiota, leading to all these kind of contemporary conditions that plague many of us. And the solution perhaps is diets rich in fermented foods to restore or maintain a healthy microbiota. So if I were writing the guidelines, um, I think there's enough evidence. Again, most of it is through these associated studies um, to warrant this statement. Fermented foods, including those that contain live microorganisms should be included as part of a healthy diet. So in addition to um, these uh, important nutrients, I would add some yogurt, some miso, some kimchi, and you couldn't go wrong with a glass of red wine. Um, so as we know, um, the famous quote from Hippocrates, all disease begins in the gut. And I would tweak that a little bit um, and say good health begins in the gut. Um, again, I wanna, <clears throat> again, thank the Fermentation Association for 
um, inviting me um, and I can be reached at rhutkins1unl.edu. Again, I want to thank um, the University of Nebraska for um, giving me the opportunity to have a terrific career here. And, um, and with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you, Bob. That was really an interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I, uh, as a producer, uh, and having uh, started this uh, effort uh, to put live culture products on the uh, grocer's standard grocery shelf, uh, you know, I started uh, doing it as a result of unique flavors that I could achieve through fermentation that weren't present in acidified uh, uh, products. And then, uh, as uh, often happens, somebody came running through the party screaming probiotics, probiotics. Um, what, what do you see as the uh, path forward for producers who want to say something about the health content of their foods? And, you know, unfortunately, not based on RTCs, but based on, you know, uh, anecdotal, you know, my uncle ate sauerkraut and lived for 100 years kind of thing. Um, because in the industry, as you pointed out, there are three studies of sauerkraut, probably insufficient to make bold claims. What would you uh, advise the food industry as regards, um, you know, the uncertain content of, of the uh, microbes? It doesn't mean that there aren't probiotics, but it does mean that what is in the microbiota there is un unknown and it has an uncertain result. Where do we go with this? So, so the, the consensus statement said on, on, that, on that question was that the manufacturers ought to use, um, they should not use probiotics on there. They should use things like live, it contains live and active cultures. If they, um, if they actually um, collect the data, they can even say contains millions or billions as the case may be live and active cultures. I think I would. I think that's a reasonable um, um, reason. It's reasonable. It's accurate, provided they've done that. Um, but I would not go much further than that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. But um, uh, would you? Uh, it, it it seems like there 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 might be a middle ground in there somewhere that you know. Uh, contains strains known to be probiotic or you know something of that sort where you can sort of weasel word your way in there. The thing that I'm interested in is the bifurcation of the industry here in that according to the definition of the, the ISAP, um, it fits the uh, supplement industry very nicely in that they do have access to uh, uh, known strains. The CFU count is known. And if they do their job right, they could probably cite an RTC that supports what it is they're claiming. So that means that the, the, the uh, supplement industry is in fact the probiotic industry and that the fermented foods uh, industry is uh, the live culture, uh, you know, uh, microbiome supporting uh, thing. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, again, um, what we were pretty adamant about in the in the consensus paper was our um, our view that that you ought that fermented foods ought not to be using that probiotic as an adjective probiotic fermented food unless they follow and satisfy the definition of a probiotic. Mm -hmm. And and that's the purpose of these consensus statements is to pr provide clarity. Um, and I'm sure that you know. Don't forget, in Europe, you can't even use the word probiotic um, because it, it confers a health benefit, right. which, according to the EFSA, has not been reached right. except for one product, and that's yogurt. Um, so, so we're trying to provide. We, we we take these terms very seriously. And as I think Mary Allen pointed out in her, her webinar a couple of weeks ago, that if you go online, you will see, and you can even see on products at the grocery store, you will see the use of, the, of that term probiotic fermented food all over the place. Mm 
And well, we don't think that's appropriate unless that food is like a, um, like a probiotic containing yogurt or kefir. Well, I, I, I have to say as a, a producer, I support that. And um, it's, it's been a term uh, uh, as my, my own background has nothing to do with microbiology, but has to do with uh, engineering. And as an engineer, I was pretty unsatisfied with people claim, making bold and unsubstantiated claims. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we wouldn't want people to walk past the idea that uh, fermented foods confer, you know, uh, some benefit. Uh, and while it may be unknown exactly what that is, uh, I think there's a general consensus in the scientific community that uh, live culture foods are uh, additive, not negative to your uh, overall health. And I would, uh, you know, the, this issue that I raised before about the lack of, of RCTs. This is a, um, a barrier that we have to get past. Um, again, uh, I think last week when I was preparing for this, um, you can look up clinicaltrials.gov and it will have a list of all the ongoing clinical trials. And <clears throat> there's a good, and it has good filters on there. So you can look up fermented foods and see what clinical trials um, around the world are, um, are in progress. And I think I saw three in progress. Yeah. So this is unfortunate. Um, and, but, you know, the, 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 as I pointed out before, you know, there's no like um, kimchi lobby to, with <laughs> millions and millions of dollars. Um, you know, the, the dairy industry funds a lot of work and, and um, Chris Tefelli, God, why does Chris, Chris's last name uh, escape me for a moment? But he, he talked about some of the dairy research and they sponsor a lot of, dairy, of research, but it's on dairy, but there's no kimchi organization. There's no sauerkraut lobby to fund million dollar studies um, right. th that we need. Well, there is the Fermentation Association. And I think one of our missions is to uh, uh, at some point bring, bring focus and, and economic focus to uh, an area that big pharma is not excited about because big pharma there's not the likelihood that there's a, a pot of gold waiting for you at the end of your rtc here what the pot of gold is you know <laughs> document documented human health and uh, unfortunately we don't have the economic muscle individually to do these kinds of studies hopefully the fermentation association or through associations like this will be able to uh, uh, fund or in, at least in the future explore more of these things. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, get to a couple of questions that were on the list here. Um, and uh, uh, one question I thought was kind of interesting and germane to the uh, uh, subject that you had is how, how is the definition in your mind, is there an evolving definition of fermentation or uh, is this a bedrock biological process that really doesn't change over time? Uh, well, um, I'm, <clears throat> I think part of the, um, part of our thinking is that this is, a, hopefully this will last for a little bit, um, but we're, we're open to, um, to scientific discourse. And if there's, um, you know, it's only, this definition is only as good as, as how well the community accepts it. Um, 13 experts don't make, you know, don't make rules, um, but I, th we think it has some staying power. Um, I, um, after we came up with this definition, I actually went back and, um, and looked at some of the old fermentation textbooks, and it's, it's not remarkably different from what, um, how, how fermented foods were defined 40 years ago. Yeah. So, well, um, I, as, again, as a producer, I think you guys have come up with a fine definition and uh, uh, fascinating uh, when you apply it to various scenarios. So I, for one, am satisfied with your definition. And I think uh, uh, one, one additional thing that, that uh, occurred to me uh, sometime back is that uh, fermentation is the original form of solar energy where we gather solar energy during the growing season 
and then we do something to it, we process it, and then it persists as a, a food substance for us during periods of time when the sun is no longer available. So we're in, in effect uh, use, using the uh, fermentation as a process by which we store solar energy. And uh, it, that's, it seems to me that that's the role historically that uh, fermentation has played where you have summer crops that turn to winter foods uh, through the process of fermentation in the absence of refrigeration or other mechanical or chemical cures. So uh, with that, I think uh, uh, we may want to get Amelia in here and uh, get a few questions that have come in from the chat room. Hi, thank you so much, Bob. This was super fascinating. Now we, it gives us more motivation to go eat our fermented foods, right? <laughs> All right, so my first, our first audience question, um, we had uh, Dr. Perez Diaz from the USDA. She asked, Bob, I am curious to know what triggered the need for a formal definition of fermented foods? Yeah, so um, I, I, I was not um, very enthusiastic about it, to tell you the truth, because I thought we all kind of know what, what fermented foods are. Why do we need to do this definition? But um, what struck, I was at a, um, a nutrition conference with a lot of well-known nutritionists and I gave my fermentation talk. And at the end of a 30 minute talk, the first question I got was from a, from a, a PhD in nutrition said, what are fermented foods? And then I realized I, maybe we do need a definition. You know, those, the, those of us that work in this field um, kind of know what we're talking about when we say fermented foods, but, but a lot of people, even people trained in foods um, do not understand this concept. Um, and so I, so that's why, so that changed my mind on it. And that's why we decided, and, and there were some nuances in there too, the question about health benefits, probiotics, live microbes, fermented things that we think are fermented, like, um, like I, the example I gave before about the olives and the pickles, um, that aren't fermented. Well, Wait a certainly, second. Oh, if sorry, I, David, continue. I just inject uh, what, what complicates that even further is the number of derivative foods that are from, uh, created through the process of fermentation and then used at an ingredient level. For example, uh, the most obvious one is the acidification process common throughout the food industry coming from you know, essentially fermented uh, grains. And uh, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about that blending of non-fermented and fermented uh, foods that where a fermented byproduct is used as an ingredient in a food and it really couldn't exist otherwise without that? So of course, you know, vinegar is the most common, one of the most common food ingredients that there is, but just because you put vinegar into ketchup or mustard or salad dressing doesn't make that final food fermented. Now, the, what, what's interesting that actually, and they didn't point this out, and we didn't even address this in the, in the consensus paper, is that there are um, ingredient, many food ingredients now that are um, herbs and spices and other things that are getting fermented to enhance their nutritional properties or functional properties that are then included into different processed foods. Again, that doesn't make the processed food fermented, but it may add some nutritional benefits by virtue of the fermentation. Maybe vitamins were produced or something, um, but does add to the nutritional properties of those finished foods. Uh, the second part of Dr. Perez Diaz's question, she asked, uh, it is my understanding that a main function of fermentation is the removal of the sugars intrinsically present in foods by their controlled conversion to acids and or ethanol. What is the opinion of the expert panel on the need to completely remove sugars from a food to call it fermented? Would a food with a re reduced sugar concentration be called fermented, partially fermented, or mildly fermented? What are your thoughts? <clears throat> um, we did address the, the notion that fermentation does reduce um, the, the, fermentable sugar, the fermentable carbohydrate content, but we did not um, delineate between um, completely fermented, partially fermented um, foods. So 
again, yogurt is the best example of a healthy fermented food. Um, and yet yogurt, the amount of lactose in yogurt is high. Lactose can contain 5%, um, yogurt contain 5% lactose, almost as much as what was in the original milk. Um, only a, maybe 20% of the lactose in milk is fermented to make yogurt. So there's plenty of lactose left. Um, but the, fortunately, the yogurt microbes during, dig, during um, digestion of that yogurt can, can handle the rest of that lactose so that even a lactose intolerant individual can, can tolerate lactose. So, so we did not, the, the answer to the question is we did not um, um, delineate between partially fermented or completely fermented. Of course, I, I love sweet wines. Um, and again, some of the, some of the, the fructose and, and sucrose and glucose are still there in those wines um, at the end of fermentation. And I, I would add to this uh, that uh, fermentation is, is a process and there is an asymptote at the end where all the carbohydrates, well, almost all the carbohydrates are, are exhausted and fermentation process would largely cease at that time. However, from an organoleptic point of view and what you really, you know, how to use fermentation as a verb uh, and Personally, as a producer, I think of it more as a verb that I am fermenting my uh, vegetables and I want them, I want to use fermentation to create a certain combination of fermented fresh that really makes the vegetable just explode with flavor. You go past that if you're before if you're if you arrive too soon and you pull the thing out before it's uh, enough uh, acid conversion has occurred. There's really not much value uh, from a flavor point of view, but there if you let it go and exhaust all the carbohydrates, then also you you risk uh, changing the character of the food substantially, uh, both because of time and, and the exhaustion of the sugars and somewhere in the middle there. So uh, to uh, Dr. Perez Diaz's uh, uh, point, I, I think of it as we are fermenting and foods that we sell, when I'm talking to our consumers, you know, we talk about the idea that this product is in the process of fermenting. And uh, also I think that from what I've seen of the, the uh, microbiological uh, work done in this area, this is the point at which the cultures are flourishing and often at their strongest because that's when there's the most carbohydrates available and you're at some point in the bell-shaped curve of growth that you can argue for. There's a lot of uh, probiotic, here I am using that term, uh, a lot of uh, live culture uh, value there but at the same time, you have the optimal taste, texture, and, and possibly nutrition. I don't know about the nutrition, but I'm assuming that there's probably great value there as well. Thank you for that. Okay, Bob, uh, we had a few questions going back to yogurt. Uh, I know your lab has studied so many fermented foods. Have you looked at plant-based yogurt yet? Does plant-based yogurt yield the same results as a dairy yogurt? Um, so, <laughs> great question, um, and I, uh, there have not been nearly so many studies on, on plant-based yogurts, and um, it's a little bit of, and, and I've, um, I've been introducing this topic into my, uh, the classes that I teach just in the last year or so, um, because they've made such a presence in the market, but they're a little bit different in that um, the manufacturer is different in part because they don't rely on lactose fermentation and coagulation of casein in milk. They rely on other way, so that there could be a fermentation, but um, they're not fermenting lactose, they're fermenting other sugars. They might not even be the traditional yogurt microbes. And um, many of them will have added probiotics, but they will also have, um, usually they'll have thickening agents because they don't coagulate like milk would coagulate. So they're a little bit of a different animal, so to speak. Um, but um, 
the main nutritional benefit of yogurt for which a health claim exists in Europe is, la is lactose intolerance. And so the plant-based milks don't really carry that, um, that attribute, um, but they, will, they often will contain well-recognized probiotic strains. That, um, so they would have a health benefit conferred by those probiotics. Yeah. It's a great, it's a, there's gonna be a lot more interest in, in, in the plant-based um, kefirs. And in fact, the, the, the water kefirs and the coconut kefirs um, are grabbing a, a big share of the market. Yeah. A lot of interest there. Yes, they are. We also had a question, you know, related to these plant-based alternatives, um, a question about precision fermentation, like this fermentation technology being used by like Clara Foods and Perfect Day to make, you know, real eggs and dairy alternatives. How does that fit into the definition of fermentation? Well, so that's one that we, <clears throat> we did not address. Um, I alluded to that before of novel ingredients made by fermentation, um, but uh, I, I have to um, claim that I don't know, I don't, I'm not, I don't know that, that segment of the, um, of the fermentation industry. And so I have to kind of beg off on that one. I'll have to do some research on it. You no, know, I understand. Like you said, we, we still need more research on it. Um, all right, we had a few studies. I'm sorry, have I frozen again? <laughs> well, you can hear my voice, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, have you seen, uh, we had a few questions about this Korean study that has been coming out about, uh, you know, COVID-19, uh, COVID its primary food source, I guess, is purine. And now there's a study showing that the, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, L. Gasserie com competes for purine. What what have you seen about that? Um, I'll have to look at that because I have not seen that. I know when the um, the um, the Korean paper or the uh, kimchi paper came out or the, the fermented cabbage paper came out um, um, earlier this year as a preprint um, before it was actually published. There was a lot of controversy about that, and there was uh, even some criticism that came out in the press that was uh, claiming that that paper was um, uh, making unsubstantiated claims about the role of fermentation on reducing COVID severity. So um, again, there, there'll be so many papers coming out on COVID in the next year, two or three years, and, and, the, and the association of diet and maybe even fermented foods. Um, so I, I kind of like to hedge my bets on that one. Let's see how the data looks. Um, there's so much epidemiology data on not only diet, um, but other lifestyle factors that may have, um, uh, that may have mitigated the severity of COVID or made it, or maybe even worsen the severity of COVID. In addition to the things that, we've, that, that have already been studied like age and obesity, and predisposed conditions. Um, so let's see how that data plays out over the next year. Yes, and I know that, I mean, that kimchi study, we get so many questions about that on our social media accounts. And it's not a randomized control study. It's, you know, not peer reviewed. Um, so important things to note. Okay, Dr. Fred Bright with the USDA, he asked, he said, we traditionally uh, call fermentation an anaerobic process, not requiring oxygen. Should this be distinguished from foods that are fermented with anaerobic molds? Yeah, so that that was one of the the um, the, the reasons why we we chose to make a broader definition and get and and got away from that um, uh, anaerobic metabolism um, connected to the um, oxi to the um, oxidation of or to the uh, utilization of oxidized substrates and um, and, and using pyruvate as an electron acceptor, we then we wanted to get away from that narrow biochemistry definition and apply a more um, broad-based definition that didn't require um, anaerobiasis, for example. And so, um, again, the mold fermentations are aerobic. They don't even necessarily um, have uh, carbohydrates involved in those fermentations. Some of those are, are protein metabolism, lipid metabolism. So 
we did we did we did not subscribe to that notion that that there had to be um, um, an oxidative metabolism. So I think that's what Fred's getting at there. Yeah, um, and and even some of the um, uh, the cheeses that are made with um, um, with a rind fermentation. Again, those are uh, the, the pH doesn't drop. The pH actually rises. Ammonia is produced. Um, so again, those we, we felt that we needed a definition that was was broader and that fit fermented foods in a in a more general way. What do you think is the largest obstacle obstacle for the general public to accept? fermented foods in their daily diet. I loved that comparison you gave of like the, the typical college student diet. What do you think is the, the obstacle to start including fermented foods? So <laughs> I, gave a, I gave a lecture um, early in my career, it was like 30 years ago, and on the num how many bacteria they were eating when they, or were consuming when they ate a cup of yogurt. You know, I, so I said, you know, you might get a hundred billion live microbes in a cup of yogurt. And a st student reached out to me later and said that they went back to the, their dorm room and they gargled with mouthwash for an hour to get rid of all those microbes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and, I, and so, you know, so that, that's what you're, we're kind of up against. Now a lot's changed in those, in, in those 30 years, but I still have college students, admittedly, I'm in Nebraska. It's in the heartland, and it's a um, it's a um, F, it's a uh, cuisine challenged environment that I live in. Um, but um, so a lot of kids they don't know they've never heard of kimchi or miso. Um, you know they know yogurt, they know cheese, and they know sausage. Um, but they come into the class and, and we we eat these foods, and they uh, you know even tempeh. Um, they go, oh, that's not bad. Now that's not to say they're gonna go out and buy it or you know, consume it regularly. But I think as, as um, and the miso is a good example. Um, nobody's heard of miso until all, the, until all these sushi restaurants started to open up. You could buy sushi. There's five sushi restaurants in, the, in Lincoln, Nebraska and they all serve miso soup. And so now people are starting to get um, accustomed to, um, to, these, to these different ethnic um, foods, and I think as um, as the world becomes more ethnically diverse um, through cuisine, through restaurants, um, they will be more accepting and and receptive to all these different kinds of fermented foods from around the world. Thank you. Okay, my last question for you. This is this is for both of you, for Bob and Dave. Do you think the poor regulation of fermented beverages, but these health nutrition claims similar to you know, dietary supplements, do you think that is a reason for concern? Um, so Amelia, I, I, I'm not sure what you're getting, what, what kind of, maybe Dave has a response. I'm not sure what kind of claims you're referring to. I wanna be careful. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I'm assuming this is a question get, that came through. I'm, I'm assuming what they're getting at is that, uh, you know, we have, there's, a, as we know, there's a big difference between a true fermented pickle, for example, and a, you know, vinegar soaked pickle, a shelf stable one. So do you think that is a concern we, that could become more of a regulation issue in America, how we're using the word fermented for products that, you know, or maybe use not true fermented method. Oh, I see, okay. Um, so again, the, the, among the stakeholders that we wanted to reach with the consensus paper were, um, were regulators, but they have not been very, they, in my view, they have not been very interested in making these kinds of distinctions. So you really have to look at a food label and you have to know a little bit about food science and food technology to distinguish a fermented pickle from a non-fermented pickle, to be quite honest. And um, I don't think that the FDA has um, taken much interest. I can't speak to other jurisdictions in, in, around the world. Um, like I said before, in some, in some countries in Europe, they have um, these uh, PDO laws that say how you, can, how you make certain foods. But um, I don't think the FDA has any um, appetite, sorry for the pun, to, um, to start regulating these kinds of foods, to my knowledge, maybe Dave. Uh, 
can speak to that. Well, I, the only thing I would add, uh, and, and I'm not sure if this adds anything, but I, I personally, and when I look around the industry and I look at people who, uh, you know, claim to have live culture foods, and I'm the kind of guy that'll go buy the thing and bring it home and culture it and put it under a microscope to see what they're talking about. Um, I've found some uh, notable discrepancies between what the label says and what my microscope tells me. Um, and I, I think as a producer, uh, I believe like many other things, you know, we want to guard the truth. And uh, what is the truth? Well, the truth is the best thing that we know uh, that we can establish through a scientific uh, method. And um, when we talk about using science, we're really talking about a method designed to uh, develop building blocks of knowledge upon which we can build as we go into the future. And if we find ourselves building some extravagant bridge off to nowhere that is built out of uh, claims that, you know, cures athletes, foot, cures warts, you know, live 10 years longer, which is what I always tell people at trade shows. And I tell them, if, if you don't live 10 years longer, come and see me, I'll give you your money back. Um, these kinds of uh, claims, I think, while they may have a short-term stimulative effect, uh, long-term, uh, have the run. There's a risk that we have some sort of uh, distortion uh, that you know we can't really reconcile what's being claimed to what is the reality. When the reality itself is actually very good, maybe doesn't cure cancer, but very good. And um, so I worry, and I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure that I would say I welcome FDA oversight on on this matter. But I think that the industry itself, and I think maybe one of the roles of the fermentation association or trade associations like this, try to get uh, a, a, a producer consensus in the same way that we have a scientific consensus that would help harmonize the reality as determined by the scientific community to the claims that we are all making as we go you know, sell our products. I'm happy to say if you eat one of the pickles that I make, it's a really good tasting pickle. And I'm not gonna really argue too much beyond that. I think it's good for you. I, all the things that uh, my friends over at UC Davis tell me and guys like Bob and what have you, I think it's probably pretty good, but I'll tell you one thing I can guarantee you, it tastes really good. Thank you so much, Bob and David. Uh, we didn't have a chance to get to everyone's questions. I put um, Dr. Hutkin's email. He has generously offered to uh, answer additional questions. I put his email into the chat bar. Um, and thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar. We will post a recording on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. We also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks, including The Many Sides of Kefir with Julie Smolanski of Lifeway Kefir, Building a Fermented Brand with Sasha Strauss, and A Yeast Primer with Richard Priest. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks, Thank Mo. You, Bob.